There is a podcast broadcasting today that has spoiled dozens of motion pictures. A mindless knob joke machine. It is as if God created the devil's podcast and gave it. Jaws! This is Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect films most dastardly schemes, then compete to improve them. I'm your host, Craig, and this week's movie is 1975's legendary blockbuster monster movie, Jaws. So, Peril Pals, take a midnight dip, treat yourself to a bigger boat, and let's get diabolical. Welcome to this week's episode. As host for this week, I'm the mayor or mayor of the panel of peril, who will compete against me at the close of the show in a bid to become the world's greatest tourist attraction, as we each try to come up with the best alternative plan for the movie villain of the week before we vote to name this week's most diabolical. As ever, I'm joined by three ichthyologists. Please introduce yourselves and tell me who is your favourite movie or TV mayor or mayor? Ben here. And my favourite TV or movie mayor nah. is Mayor Joseph Fitzgerald, O'Malley Fitzpatrick, O'Donnell, The Edge, Quimby. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Diamond Joe. I didn't know he had middle names. What episode is that from? I don't know. I didn't know that either, but it was on his wiki. Okay. Cinemaster, your favourite TV or movie mayor? Hello. Cinemaster speaking. My favourite uh, high-ranking council official, known as a mayor, correctly as a mayor, Mm-mm. is the really the the mayor of mayors. It has to be said, and it's from the twenty twenty one movie Paw Patrol, the movie, and it's Mayor Humdinger. <laughs> <laughs> Humdinger is the villain of Paw Patrol. Yeah, but he's still the mayor. I insist that we cover it on this show. Now that you said that, yeah. It's a much maligned, underrated classic of a movie uh, that we should revisit. I actually really like it. I think it's it's a big step up from the TV series. Yeah, I, I do. I think <laughs> they're funny, yes. Copaganda. Nothing more. <laughs> I'll be taking a day off from that episode. No. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are growing up, so I don't need to watch that crap. Oh, okay. Copaganda. <laughs> Gaz, your favourite TV or movie mayor or mayor? Gaz here, and my favourite TV or movie mayor is Mayor Wilkins from Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 3. Yes. Ooh. His sugar daddy the energy most, towards yeah. evil slayer faith. Surely the most diabolical mayor on TV, but very pleasant. Yeah, I knew him. He would never hurt anybody, is what a lot of the people who, who live near him would have said. He seems like such a nice man. <laughs> yeah. They're all saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Very happy they exploded in a shower of snake meat. I'm sure, they say the same about Grant Shaps. <laughs> <laughs> and as for me, my favourite uh, movie mayor is Lenny Clutch, the New York City mayor from Ghostbusters. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. He was my second pick if anybody took Mayor Wilkins. Lenny, you will have saved the lives of millions of voters. <laughs> Get him out of here. <laughs> my second pick would have been Homer Simpson in The Mayor, where he uh, <laughs> cocks his gun. <laughs> and my other backups, I have to have four backups in case you all pick some of my top three, right? So my other backups were The Mayor from Tom Goes to the Mayor, which is Eric Wareheim and Tim Heidecker show, and uh, Mayor West from Family Guy. Uh, that's yeah. good mm. TV's most demented mayor. You three picked my initial first first thoughts. All of them were, I was like, well, they're all there. I thought, well, they've got it. Either one or two have gone. Maybe not all three, but I'm not going to take a risk on. But you've taken them all, so there you go. Well, I had a backup in case you took Diamond Joe, which I knew you would turn if you'd have gone first. (laughs) Sorry, Cinemaster, you handsome, handsome man. Uh So I had Lou Carpenter from Neighbours. No one would have had that. (laughs) Curveball, curveball. 
<laughs> Time now to delve into this week's film. Producers Dick Zanuck and David Brown snapped up the film rights to Peter Benchley's 1974 novel Jaws before it was published, sniffing a smash hit. Fresh off his first feature, The Sugarland Express, which the pair had also produced, Wunderkin Steven Spielberg was hired as director, having practically auditioned for the job with his 1971 made-for-TV killer truck movie, Duel. Jaws follows the efforts of Amity Police Chief Martin Brody as he attempts to maintain the safety of the island's residents, including his own family, following a series of lethal shark attacks. Brody's efforts are frustrated by smug, sleazy Amity Mayor Larry Vaughan, who seeks to keep the local business leaders happy by keeping the beaches open to tourists during the summer season. Brody is aided by marine biologist Matt Hooper and professional shark hunter Quint as they overcome social tensions to trap down and kill the deadly great white shark they eventually identify as the killer. With its B-movie plot and A-plus production, it's the legendary movie that redefined the summer blockbuster for a generation and catapulted one of the USA's most beloved directors onto a career of crowd-pleasing smash hits. As it's now safe to go back in the water, I thought a nice jawbreaker would be just the ticket. So I'm going to tell you three facts about Quint actor Robert Jaws, Robert Shaw, Mm. one of which will be a lie. Number one, Spielberg became interested in casting Robert Shaw after seeing his portrayal of formidable blonde-haired, blue-eyed spectre assassin Donald Red Grant in the Bond film From Russia With Love. Though Shaw's stature in that film had been exaggerated by having him stand on apple crates to appear taller than star Sean Connery. Number two. When Shaw's rental house in Martha's Vineyard was shot at by a local eccentric during the filming of Jaws, Shaw's manservant, Blossom, who was a friend of Anthony Hopkins, went to the door dressed in a robe and slippers to investigate the bullet holes in the door and was heard to say, I believe they're shooting, sir. (laughs) Number three. Shaw nicknamed the mechanical shark Bruce after his friend Bruce Dern, whom he described as having more teeth than the entire Osmond family. One of those is a red herring. So I've heard something like the last one before, mm. but I, you, you could have twisted it. You could have bloody twisted it. Well, we always twist something, don't we? You're always twisting my melon. We're, we're so diabolical. Twisting my mitts, man. B sounds a bit far-fetched, so I'm going to say B. Number two, B is false. All right, and Gaz? I concur with Ben's guess. I believe the second one to be false because he, he, presumably the person who, who delivered that line, I believe their shooting would have to be John Gielgud's butler from Arthur. Is he the only person that could have <laughs> delivered that line? <laughs> yeah, okay. And Cinemaster? I'm just a bit different, although I do smell something a bit chummy about number three, so I'm going to say number three. Or C. Well, I thought, you know, because Cinemaster has a history of of looking into the uh, trivia from these films, and I thought he might know this, but it was in fact Steven Spielberg who named the shark Bruce after his lawyer. So the story about Robert Shaw's house getting shot at is completely true, and his manservant was nicknamed Blossom, <laughs> uh, and he was a friend of Anthony Hopkins. There you go. Crazy story. So Rimmer says of the polymorph, I believe, that it has more teeth than the entire Osman family. Nice bit of red dwarf gem. (laughs) Now, let's find out what the panel of peril thought of the film before we throw open the chat to talk in more detail about our favourite aspects, sequences and lines. And let's start this time with Gwaz. There's not a lot you can say about Jaws, really, is there, that that hasn't been said already? No, only your personal opinion. (laughs) (laughs) I suppose no one's really interested in that, so let's move on. (laughs) (laughs) In terms of the kinds of films that I enjoy long-term, Pearl Pals will know that horror is my favourite genre, and so Jaws is is right up my alley, and it's quite a rare beast of a horror film in that it's set, in the most part, in broad daylight, and it really shows... Spielberg's craft that he's able to build such suspense and even jump scares whilst in broad daylight. Yeah. 
it's the perfect mix of, like you said in your intro, B movie conceit, uh, stellar, stellar cast: Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, yes. Robert Shaw. Tremendous, iconic score from John Williams. Mm. Shooting at sea, which you know everybody says is a nightmare, and I can well believe, but it appears easy from the images that are captured there. There's, it's always framed perfectly, as solid as a rock. It's tremendous. An easy five out of five film. Wonderful. Let's hear from Ben next, please. Yeah, I agree with Gaz there. It's a stone cold classic, isn't it? It still gives me the heebie jeebies, and I must have seen it dozens of times over the years. The performances are great. The natural lighting and location shots make it feel really authentic. The characters are three dimensional and believable. So much so that you actually you ignore the parts where the shark looks a bit rubbery. Mm. Yeah. You kind of forgive it because everything else is so believable. I'd say it sags a touch when they're out on the boat, but then they start singing Show Me the Way to Go Home and it saves mm-hmm. saves it. <laughs> Which we're gonna do at the end of the episode. <laughs> oh yes. All in all, I give it uh, it's still one of the very best horror films out there, out of five. Lovely. And Cinemaster, do you concur? Oh, absolutely. And this is the usual point where I put my nostalgia cap on and say, I remember watching it for the first time as a kid, mm. being absolutely terrified. And then whenever you get into open water, <laughs> you always think, yeah. is Jaws there when you're a kid? <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're in a lake or if you're in a swimming pool, you always think, what if it, what if a shark got in here and went mad? <laughs> That's going to be the quote. What if a shark went, got in here and went mad? <laughs> <laughs> went absolutely apeshit. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's just me. Yeah, it's the quintessential horror movie. The supporting cast is there for one reason, and that's the support. The, the big guy, who is, he's showing his age now, bless him. But what Spielberg does as well is play the old, less is more. And for large parts of the film, you let your imagination do a lot of the work. And it's still a masterpiece. It's up there with Alien. It's up there with The Thing. They'll never die. And really, in my eyes, never grow old. Yeah. I know that you're a big fan, uh, rightly of films that hold back the visual of the monster and let your imagination do all the work. Yeah. Yep. And I think this is the quintessential, you know, version of that. And what guys were saying about the iconic score, in a way the score fills in for the shot. You completely yep. associate that sound with the movement and with the dread. Not only is it an iconic score, it's really kind of a, and this is an overused cliche phrase, but it's really kind of a character in the, in the film. The score, oh, yeah. because every time you hear it, the comedy version of it is the mobile phone that the, the dinosaur eats in the third Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. <laughs> and the cast, yeah, it is stellar, but only obviously for the, the leads and pretty much everyone else in it was largely unknown at the time. And that was intentional. That's what Spielberg wanted. He wanted audiences to believe that this could happen to them, to anybody. Some of the the casting choices, they're pretty well known, so I won't go through them, but a lot of people that were considered were rejected on the basis that they were just too well known. And like Charlton Heston, for example, you couldn't buy him as like a small island police chief because he's no. just, he's Charlton Heston, he's too big. Too over know? the top. Yeah. Get your filthy teeth off me. You damn dirty shark. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the shooting at, on the ocean, I think, really assists with the jump scares because the, yeah. the ocean's obviously, it, it's, in this, it's kind of almost inky, navy blue colour and you don't see the shark until it comes right out of the water when, uh, mm. you know, when Roy Scheid is chumming the waters. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, that was a good point Gaz made is, you know, most of the films in the daylight, but that's because yeah. the, the ocean's doing the work of the dark, isn't it, essentially? Mm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's this mysterious, unknown, dark space, yeah. most unexplored part of the world. So still a lot of mystery in it. I think that really works. You said that it sags a bit, Ben, when they get out on the ocean. But I, th- I really think that the relationship between the three mains is the heart of this film. Yeah. And I think it was great to let that breathe and, and have them explore that for a bit. I feel similarly about Jurassic Park. A lot of people say that Jurassic Park is just a... I think we must have talked about this in our Jurassic Park episode, but they'll say that it's just a movie of spectacle and special effects. But for me, the character dynamics between Grant and Jeff Goldblum's character and Laura Dern's character, Ellie, and what the fuck's Jeff what's Goldblum's character called? Ian Malcolm. <laughs> Ian Malcolm. That is a kind of a retread of Jaws for me in, in a 
very different dynamic, obviously. And uh, one of the major changes they made from the book for Jaws is that in the book, Hooper has an affair with Brody's wife. And I think that would have absolutely killed the vibe of the movie. Oh, so yeah. I'm glad that they cut that. Yeah. She's another brilliant bit of casting as well. She's fantastic, isn't she? Yeah, Lorraine Gary. Uh, she's absolutely brilliant. The, she, the way she she's that support to Brody through it all yeah. and stuff like that. And then when he starts yeah. becoming a bit scared, then she sees his logic behind it, and then it's brilliant. Yeah, she's just fantastic as well. I think that's why she kind of survives him in the sequels and and becomes you know starts sort of takes the yeah. reins of the main character there. Yeah. yeah, she's brilliant. Let's go on to our favourite moment, and let's start, please, with the cinema stuff. Uh, it's it's really <laughs> if you want to never start with a cinema stuff. You haven't learned this yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd say <laughs> the first swimmer, Chrissy, when she gets got, it just sets yeah. the tone, and it is still yeah. packs a punch on the terror rating. Hundred percent, still does. Yeah, that hasn't diminished at all it's really terrifying so yeah i'd love that she was a stunt performer of course not an actor yeah. before that i don't yeah. know if if this was dialogue that was written for her but what really gets me about her death is that she keeps saying it hurts and i'm like oh jesus fucking christ didn't they tie ropes around her waist to drag her around and it broke a rib Ah, uh, right yeah that first death went on a lot longer than i remember it it felt really long this time toying with its prey I kind of think that that first kill is like his first chomp of a person and he's like, oh, how should I kill her? And he's dragging her around a bit and then he just goes, plop, and just takes her. <laughs> that's it. Okay. He's like, oh, that's, yeah. that's actually quite nice. Whoa. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to eat the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Humans are incredibly Moorish, though. So. Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> the lad that's eyeing her up before they go for the old skinny dip. Is that yeah. like a grown-up Charlie Bucket? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gals, what about your favourite moments from yours? Hmm, I was going to go with that. So, uh. hmm. Let's say the, the finale where Roy Scheider's alone on the sinking boat by himself, Jaws bursts in through the window like a big old bloody drama queen and then has to, <laughs> to climb on, what's it called? The, the bird's nest. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah crow's, crow's nest. nest. Crow's nest, that's it, with his harpoon gun. It's brilliant, again, just building the tension. I guess you kind of know yeah. he's, he's going to kill it somehow, but still, yeah, it is very, very tense. And yeah. as someone who's not the best swimmer in the world, just the thought of not having the boat for backup oh, anymore God. for me is just awful, awful. If I was in the sea and a shark was coming towards me, I wouldn't even bother trying to swim. I'd be like, well, that's me done. <laughs> <laughs> would you not try and bop it on the nose i suppose i could give it the old rocky haymaker try and keep it away from your main arteries have they done rocky versus jaws yet <laughs> surely it's in the offing an asylum special <laughs> ben favorite moment from yours mine's a very very short moment but i just think it kind of sums up the creativity and quality of steven spielberg's direction and it's this yeah. shot just after the first kill, actually, and Brody's on the typewriter, and you mm. see him type out shark attack. And it's the way it's framed. You see that kind yeah. of the whole face of the typewriter. Yeah. When you see it in black and white, there's a real impact to it. Yeah. It's nice, yeah. It just kind of sets up the rest of the film really, really beautifully, I think. Yeah. Obviously, there's some famously brilliant camera work in this. The, yeah. The, you know, the, the dolly zoom, uh, which is infamous the ferry ride the wanna which is like a beautiful ballet of blocking it's just fucking nuts but so much has been said about that but my favorite moment it's when the, the fisherman who quint is based on he's uh with his buddy on the like a jetty and it collapses and he goes in the water oh yeah and the jetty gets pulled out by the shark and then yeah. what i love is you just see the jetty turn around in the water you don't yeah. see the shark at all yeah. you're just the jetty turning around and you're like shit the shark's come back it's yeah. so clever and it's uh yeah it's fantastic so that's my yeah my favorite bit i would like to give another scene is sometimes we get an extra additional mention sure my second favorite bit is where they go to see quint when they decide to hire him 
and they go into his like workshop or cabin. Yeah. This time watching, I thought he's the fucking mad scientist of the of the film. Exactly. Yeah. Boiling jaws everywhere. Right. And there's all this dry ice smoke and the teeth coming out and the special brew yeah. and and I was like, yeah. He's this is the proper horror film and he's the mad scientist in this. And I was like, yeah. There's no way that's an accident. Him cleaning the, the teeth, yeah, it's a proper mad scientist moment. It's so good. And I was just like, that was the first time I thought that on this rewatch. That's a great observation. It's just amazing. And I was just like, wow, that's a, it's another notch on the belt for them, for me, to be honest with that. <laughs> yeah, with his rhymes as well. He's like a salty Willy Wonka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Would anybody like to highlight any of their favourite performances in this? Uh, big shout out to Bruce the shark. <laughs> yeah. Or the people who operated it, surely. No. Because yeah. people no. say that it's unrealistic, but I think it's just it's fine. I'd never look at it and go, I was not sure. Uh, there's a couple of moments <laughs> where you see it a bit rubbery, but they're very few and far between. The rest of the time, it's terrifying. Yeah. Do you know the story about George Lucas visiting the set? Spielberg asked him to put his head inside the shark, and then for a laugh, Spielberg closed it on him and he couldn't get his head out. <laughs> <laughs> they had to go over and prise the jaws open to let him out. They were worried that they'd broken it, so they were like, shit. <laughs> Is that because his head's so big? It's quiff. Got caught. Uh, yeah, he's got quite a melon on him, doesn't he, Lucas? Yeah. yeah. Especially young Lucas. Looks like a fucking matchstick. I'd like to give a little shout out to Brody's kid that when he does the bit with the... Yes, copying him. Yeah, I made a note of that. I love that. Yeah. And that's yeah. always a highlight for me every time I watch it. I just think, what a fantastic little... I wonder if that's like a, a bit that they sort of ad-libbed and then they went, yeah. oh, let's do that, let's get that. Because it seems so natural, doesn't it? It doesn't seem like forced. Yeah. It just seems like something a little kid would do to, to sort of wind his dad up. He's the master of stuff like that, Spielberg. And considering yeah. how young and fresh he was when he did this, you know, he was already yeah. doing stuff like that. You see that line through you know, Close Encounters, War of the Worlds, just such a great maker of family stories. I haven't seen uh, Fableman's yet, and I really want to see it. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh, my Ooh. God. It's so good. Yeah, I can only imagine. Because, I mean, people go on about, you know, he's uh, in his later career, he's made some quote-unquote flops like BFG, and I thought West Side Story was one of his best movies. I absolutely love it, and mm. I, I can't wait to see Fableman's. I don't think he can be around as long as Spielberg has made so many absolutely massive masterpieces and then yeah. not make one or two where people are going, ha-ha, you're not fucking that right. good after all. They're, of course, they're waiting for exactly. him to trip up, aren't they? They want that, but you consider yeah. that the whole weight of the movies that he's made that have, that have influenced so many filmmakers and brought delight to the likes of us is, is insurmountable, yeah. really, isn't it? So. Yeah, I feel like we're in a year now where a lot of those older guys are coming back with stuff that looks incredibly strong. You know, school says you can mm. kill us a flower moon. Man's mm. got Ferrari. So, yeah, exciting exciting year for cinema. Nice little story about Steven Spielberg and, and how he relates to children. The second shark attack where the dog, Pippin, is having its mm. stick yeah. thrown into the water to fetch and then it suddenly vanishes. Mm. There was a little girl, I'm not sure when exactly, I think it's about 10 years ago, who sort of did, you know, work experience type thing at the, the New York Times or the Post or whatever. Mm. And she got to interview Steven Spielberg and the one part of the film that always upset her was when Pippin the dog vanishes. So mm. she said, is there any way that the dog could have survived to, to try and make it feel better? And Spielberg span her this story on the spot uh, and <laughs> told her that the dog definitely did survive because what actually happened is that person throwing the stick wasn't the dog's owner and it got bored of entertaining this person and so it just swam home and went home for its tea <laughs> and didn't even see the shark. <laughs> yeah, I And she that. swallowed that like a load it's of chum. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanted to highlight a performance in this that I love, which is Richard Dreyfus. I just think yeah. he's so fantastic in this. He said to Spielberg when he was casting Close Encounters, you need a child for this because he really wanted to be in it. Or maybe it was for this. I, I forget it, all this stuff swimming around in my head. But he plays this with such conviction. Like when Vaughn tells him, kind of dismisses what he's saying about the danger of the shark and just how exasperated he is and that he's laughing. 
You know, he's not We're huffing. We're all going to die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and when Quint is shining him on on the boat and he sticks his gloved little fingers in his yeah. mouth and does yeah. it. Yeah, it's borderline yeah. demented. <laughs> yeah, I think he's the real heart of this. And I, I love that. Little performance I want to mention is the woman who loses her kid on the lilo. Yeah. And, and the same scene yeah. as the, the dog. Mm. She's incredible. Like, There's a huge uh, area of fandom for her. Yeah. Well deserved. Yeah. I think she had to be on it, otherwise it just wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't have yeah. that impact. And she nails it completely. Mm. Brilliant. There's that two yeah. poignant moments, isn't there? There's one where she approaches Brody, uh, confronts him, and then when Quint is doing his Indianapolis Indianapolis speech, yeah, and they're the two bits that drag you out of the movie, and then you get dunked back in more or less straight away, don't you? So yeah, and that's not from the book. They made that up. The Indianapolis yeah. thing for the movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do you know who uh, wrote the 10-page version of that before Robert Shaw whittled it down? I do, but remind me. John Milius. John Milius, yeah. Yeah. Although Milius's part has been downplayed by the overall screenwriter who said that most of it was done by Robert Shaw. Yeah. He attributed most of it to Shaw. Yeah, he took that as like inspiration, the 10-page thing. Yeah. Then did it yeah. himself in a much more punchy and, and succinct format, didn't he, so... Just to go back to the boy who goes missing on the lilo and how good his mother's actress's performance is, there's another woman when everybody's running out of the sea panicking who's just stood there holding her child going, no, 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 <laughs> who's the most hilariously melodramatic performance I think I've, ever, I've seen in some time. It's very, very funny. Is that because she didn't want her kid to come out of the water? <laughs> Presumably, because <laughs> she's making no effort to move. <laughs> okay let's move on to favorite lines and let's start this time with ben well i've got to go for it haven't i you know the thing about a shark he's got lifeless eyes Black eyes, like a doll's eyes. When he comes at you, doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and then his eyes great. roll over and you hear that horrible <laughs> type of hip pitch screaming and the water turns red. Well, Cinemaster, since you're chiming in, <laughs> let's hear from you next with your favourite line. Arr, sir! Yes, sir! Arr, arr! <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand this abuse much longer! <laughs> it's brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Gaz, favourite line? Well, I don't think my line, I don't think the character has a name. It's when some of the locals first catch a shark. Oh, yes. And then Dreyfus <laughs> says, it's just a tiger shark. And someone right in front of the camera just goes, oh, what? <laughs> he says it really camply as well, doesn't he? It's like King of the Hill. <laughs> Garlic bread. <laughs> <laughs> so... My real favourite line in this is is one that's like a cliche favourite line because it's such a memorable one, but it's... Uh, I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chum some of this shit because it's just <laughs> fucking brilliant. But just to go for one that's a bit less obvious, I love when uh, Hooper asks the locals, can you tell me if there's a good restaurant or hotel around here? And they go, yeah, just walk straight ahead. And he's like on the pier. So they want him to walk into the water. <laughs> The line that I believe inspired, well, I know, inspired Brian Singer's production company. That's some bad hat, mm. Harry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got one more. <laughs> Go on. It's Quint to Brody with his homebrew, his toast is, here's to swimming with bow-legged women. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any other things that they noted that they'd like to say about the movie Jaws? I've got a joke about the film. Ooh. Oh, God, here we go. Let's do this. I made it up myself, so prepare oh, yourselves. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Are you editing as well, so it's likely going to be in the links, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what did the mummy jaws say to the younger jaws? I don't know. I don't know. What did the mummy what jaws, the mummy say, jaws to the say to the younger, to the younger jaws? jaws? Make sure you eat well. You're looking a bit thin. <laughs> I 
what you should put in as the sound effect this week is the sound of children crying. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded like that leprechaun from Simpsons. <laughs> when you finish your joke then. There you go. Original joke. You haven't heard that anywhere before. <laughs> and hopefully never again. <laughs> Now, before we get to the competition round, if you're new to the podcast and you're enjoying it, please like, rate, review and subscribe wherever you can. It helps us keep making these and keeps us from turning our hands to running for office. We all know who the real villains in life are, don't we? Bloody politicians. Bloody politicians, (laughs) In Jaws, Mayor Larry Vaughan, motivated and blinkered by the profitable tourist trade, endangers the lives of the registered voters of Amity Island by willfully ignoring evidence of a shark attack, downplaying the danger, encouraging Chief Brody to gaslight the citizens, refuting the scientific advice of Hooper, delaying the costly hiring of Quint, and in one particularly shocking display of dastardly recklessness, pressuring a colleague to take his family into the shark-infested waters. Ultimately, Vaughan was forced to concede close the beaches and hire Quint. But how did the Panel of Peril rate Vaughan's diabolical scheme? Was it a good concept and how well was it pulled off? And this time, let's start with Ben. I don't think it was a scheme really, was it? No. He didn't think it through. Obviously, he knows the town and it's a summer town and without that income, it would have struggled for the winter. So he had that on his mind, obviously. And then he just careened from, from bad idea to bad idea. Really, he didn't. It didn't seem to have much of a plan. So you can sympathise with him in a way. We're from a seaside town, and we know if those tourist bucks didn't come in, ooh, we mm-hmm. wouldn't have had half of the treats we had in the winter: <laughs> figgy pudding, yeah, <laughs> goat stew, seagull pie, rollerblades. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of feel sorry for him in a way, but he he was also a bit of an arsehole. So he gets three florets of broccoli from me. Mm. They're all slightly Mm. salted. Mm -hmm. Sea salt. (laughs) Celtic sea salt. All right, Gaz, do you agree? Yeah, pretty much. Like Ben said, it's not it's not really much of a scheme. It's sort of the the political equivalent of just sticking your fingers in your ears and saying, ah da 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 Ah, I can't hear you. Nah nah nah. (laughs) Ignoring the evidence, twisting the coroner's report on the ferry. Yeah. Um just really just, you know, you you can't call him evil. He's just just a bit of a dickhead, isn't he? Yeah. Just a bit of a dickhead. What about you, Cinemaster? Evil or dickhead? Or evil dickhead? <laughs> just a dickhead. Yeah. He's just concerned about optics, isn't he? He wants he wants to be like every politician. They want to be re-elected. They don't want to do the difficult jobs. Doesn't matter if you're protecting people, you know, you're gonna get absolutely rinsed. So if you put in some safety measures, you are gonna be unpopular and people are gonna call you, you know, like an authoritarian or a fruitcake or something like that. But at the same time as well, you could understand because nobody was expecting a shark of that size. Nobody expects a shark of that size. <laughs> not, nobody does not know how. <laughs> well, I can see where you're coming from. But for me, this is kind of like absolving Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock of responsibility for COVID. Well, steady on that. <laughs> he is a schemer. He does deliberately obfuscate the outcome of the, the autopsy. He mm. does gaslight people. He does knowingly tell his colleague to go in the water when he knows there's still a shark in there. Yes. So uh, to me, I think that he is diabolical and I think that he, he knows exactly what he's doing. He cares more about keeping the beaches open than he does, you know, in the moment about, about the people. Yeah, that's quite a good point. You know, as a leader, you've got to make the hard decisions sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. What did we think of actor Murray Hamilton's portrayal of Mayor Vaughan? And what did we think of Vaughan as a villain character generally? He looks like he stinks of cigarettes, doesn't oh, he? Oh, yeah, Like gross. he's got yellow teeth and yellow fingers. He does, doesn't he? Looks like a used car salesman. Carpet salesman. <laughs> carpet salesman. <laughs> used carpet salesman. <laughs> His suit's made out of a carpet sample with anchors on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, he's good. He's got a very unlikable voice, hasn't he? It's kind of weaselly, kind of nerdy. Game show host hair and face, I think. Yeah. Yeah. He's always smiling, but it's not with his eyes, just like a fakey smile all the time. Yeah. And that jacket that he's always wearing as well with the anchors all all over it. 
Yeah. Ooh, what's that all about? What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any favorite moments or lines involving Mayor Vaughan? You yell shark, and we got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Yeah. You say Somebody barracuda? yells barracuda. Says, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Or he says, as you know, amity means friendship. Yeah. Does it? <laughs> I mean, it does. He's not wrong. Does it? All right, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, I just thought it was bullshit. I thought it was political bullshit. <laughs> I like when he's ribbing Hooper about wanting to be in National Geographic, which is a bit that I mentioned uh, his reaction to earlier when he's laughing. Hmm. He's a brilliant actor for this role, but he reminds me a lot of Killian in The Running Man as a that type of performance and that type of character. Uh, Sleazy game show host type. I think Killian is, but he's out for himself from the word go, isn't he? Mm. He's vicious. Mm. But I think Vaughan is just a bit misguided, perhaps, in what his priorities should be. The best thing you can say about Vaughan and is it Murray Hamilton that played him is that you never question for a second that he is who he is. Yeah, I can't remember seeing him in anything else. Jaws 2, maybe. But to me, he is that character. Yeah, exactly as mm-hmm. Spielberg intended, as I mentioned earlier. So, yeah, it works really well. This is the part of the show where the panel of peril competes for the title of Season four's Most Diabolical. Up for grabs is one point for each vote, which will go towards the series leaderboard. Mayor Larry Vaughan was willing to let the people of Amity die if it meant keeping tourism alive. But what would you have done differently, Cinemaster? Welcome to my six-point plan on how to keep safe on Amity Island while there is a killer shark on the loose. Number one, display informative posters and signage on the beach. Number two, Implement a shark watch program with local volunteers. Number three, create a shark safety hotline for reporting sightings. Number four, conduct regular shark surveillance and tracking. Number five, increase lifeguard presence and emphasize their vigilance. And number six, have people go into the water and stand perfectly still. (laughs) And that is my plan. That was you quickest one yet no no it's not not really no, just... <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't gonna do that <laughs> no these all sound like very reasonable peril point scoring cost effective measures but they're not dealing with the problem directly or quickly enough quince ten thousand in 1975 today in 2023 adjusted for inflation would be 750,000 spruce moose tokens now you understand why Vaughan was reluctant. No, instead, Vaughan has a, that little car ferry take livestock, maybe a cow, oh. perhaps some goats, a little way out to sea, then force them into the oh. water after cutting them first <laughs> to make them panic and possibly prodding them off with a cattle prod. He's going to eat the goat? What's the matter, kid? Never had lamb chops? Yep. All that blood and panic swimming is sure to attract old Brucey. Spielberg realised this some years later, in 1993 in fact, when he understood goats attract big predators like T-Rex. And that's what Bruce is, just a fish tyrannosaurus. (laughs) Once they get the measure of old Bruce, they might take something bigger or more victims to satisfy his hunger. With loads of farm animals in his tummy, he doesn't feel the need to attack humans anymore and actually becomes used to being fed by the ferry boat. Until one day, he just swims off and nothing bad happens. (laughs) (laughs) Why does he just swim off? He's full. (laughs) Forever. (laughs) Yeah. It's like an all-you-can-eat barbecue restaurant, and he's gone, ah, fuck it, I'm going home. (laughs) (laughs) How long do you reckon sharks can go without eating? Oh, they can swim for like across the oceans, can't they? And yeah. stuff like that. Because they, they've got a really slow, it doesn't Hooper say in the film, they've got a very, very slow digestive system. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So I think, you know, once he's had his fill and he's, he's been, or even if he's killed all these animals just for sport and just chomped them a bit and then spat them out or whatever. That's what I was going to suggest. Apparently it's six weeks. And I did wonder whether the shark should already be full. So was he killing mm. people out of spite? 
in the movie. Yeah. Well, they mention it, don't they? Yeah. They mention it's a territorial thing, isn't it? Right. Spite, like I said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, T-Rex, of course, doesn't want to be fed. He wants to hunt. You know, he doesn't go by mm. park schedules. It's chaos theory. Yeah. What about Bruce the shark? Does he want to be fed? Yeah, but the, these animals are just swimming around like, like the people. So he yeah. doesn't know any different. They're not chained up or anything like that. Yeah. So I did look it up. But goats and cows can both swim. They're both actually considered mm, strong yeah. swimmers. Yep. Just to add to that, elephant, yeah. elephants are also strong swimmers and have been yeah. spotted like up to All a right. mile out. I would buy that for a dollar. Elephant shark fight. Here we go. <laughs> I genuinely was thinking about getting an elephant on board, uh, but I thought getting an elephant to Amity Island in the peak of summer. Oh, what about a hippo? Oh, now we're talking. Jesus oh. Christ. Yeah. Carnage. Somewhere I've had a, I've had a conversation about that that got quite heated. People saying, <laughs> hippo can't beat a shark. What are you on about? A fucking hippo won't rip a shark to bits, you fucking dickhead. <laughs> I love the idea that people would get passionate about arguing about that. Like it matters. <laughs> genuinely. We had a, what would you rather fight? A thousand duck-sized lions or one <laughs> lion-sized duck? And this was a genuine conversation we had, yeah? I think the lion-sized duck. Uh, exactly. But one lad was like, what are you bollocks? What are you, the lions, you'd just be throwing them everywhere. I was like, they're fucking lions. They're going to be tearing chunks out of you. And he's like, bollocks, that would be bollocks. It's like the compy scene in <laughs> Lost World. You'd get nipped to death. It'd be horrible. Like piranhas. Exactly. He still won't have any of it. We still occasionally bring it up. I don't want to jump the gun, but I'm a little bit in love with this ferrying out cattle plan. So <laughs> good, good work. <laughs> All right, let's go to Gaz next. The mayor whips Amity into a fury with the following speech. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a small island community anymore. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the beach to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Well, thank you very much. This is incredible. Media will not show the magnitude of this crowd. Even I, when I turned on the TV today, I looked and I saw thousands of people here. But you don't see hundreds of thousands of people behind you because they don't want to show that. We have hundreds of thousands of people here, and I just want them to be recognised by the fake news media. Turn your cameras, please. Would you show? They came from all over the world, actually, but they came from all over our country. I just really want to see what they do. I just want to see how they cover it. I've never seen anything <laughs> like it, but it would be really great if we could be covered fairly by the media. The media is the biggest problem we have, as far as I'm concerned. The single biggest problem. The fake news. I'm honest, and I just, again, I want to thank you. <laughs> it's just a great honour to have this kind of crowd and to be before you and hundreds of thousands of Amity patriots who are committed to the honesty of our seasides and the integrity of our glorious island. Once again, I am honest. <laughs> our island has had enough. We will not take it anymore, and that's what this is all about. And to use a favourite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the shark. There is no shark, and we will stop the shark. <laughs> and there is no shark. Today, I will lay out just some of the evidence proving that there is no shark. Even when you look at last night, Brody, the cops, they're all running around like chickens with their heads cut off with boxes. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. There's never been anything like this. We will not let them silence your voices. We're not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let it happen. <laughs> and then... Loads of, loads of crazy people <laughs> just march on the beaches and fucking yeah. smash everything up and keep them open. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Smash up the beaches. Just throw in yeah. sand. Yeah. Kick it in. <laughs> <laughs> First they yeah. burn the sand until it becomes glass and then they smash it. <laughs> what would the slogan be on the on the MAGA hat of uh, Mayor Vaughan? Uh, Make Amity great again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Catchy. MAGA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be, be something more original than that, but oh well. I did put you on the spot, I guess. Doesn't Mayor Donald Vaughan say that fake media is the biggest problem? Is he trying to deflect attention from the shark? or? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what he's trying to do. Nobody knows, but it works. <laughs> That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a hypnotic power over <laughs> the Amity Patriots, and they, they're powerless to resist his wiles. I like this because he has the same game show host energy that Trump has. Yeah. He is a TV star, first and foremost, isn't he? Mm. 
Oh, this is going to be tough as fuck this week. Well done, everybody. Um, and maybe Ben. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> What compels us to look as we drive by the scene of a car crash? The power of Christ. It's rhetorical. Oh. Why can't we resist a cheeky peek at the very large, very loose stool that has just burst forth from our pink little bottoms? <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same urge that drives people to queue for hours for the thrill of a roller coaster? Or that convinces some that getting out of your car at a safari park for a selfie with a lion is a good idea? <laughs> Perhaps. And it is this fundamental human behaviour that inspires Mayor Vaughan to find a solution to the problem plaguing Amity. He stands on the empty beach, cursing the recent shark attacks. The town is in uproar, and the tourism industry all but collapsed. I wish we had more to offer, he ruse, lighting up a silky smooth Laramie. But fact is, these sandy beaches are the only reason people come here. I bet Disneyland doesn't have this problem. Then an idea strikes him, like some kind of predatory sea animal that I can't think of right now, preying on a teenage skinny dipper. <laughs> we'll make Amity the premier shark-watching destination in the world, he says, his index finger pointing skyward. People will come from all over to see the shark that terrorizes us. The mayor puts his plan into action immediately. He has a giant cage built off the coast where tourists can pay to swim with the shark. He also has t-shirts... Shell-covered photo frames, shell suits, and other shell-related souvenirs made, all bearing the slogan, I survived the Amity Death Shark. But most importantly, he has thousands and thousands of ironclad waivers printed. Mm. People are naturally curious to see the shark that caused so much terror, and they are willing to pay a lot of money to do so, particularly for the safe option of helicopter shark spotting excursions. Soon, Amity Island is booming again. The hotels are full, the restaurants are busy, and the shops are selling out of shell-covered, shark-related tat. Even more impressive is that Amity is no longer just a summer town. The morbid curiosity about the murderous shark compels people to visit all year round. Sure, there'll undoubtedly be more deaths, but that will just fuel the publicity bonfire, spreading word of Amity far and wide. In a nutshell, lean right into it. <laughs> We saw what the shark did to that cage in, in the film. Yeah. So do you think more cages are a good idea? Yeah, because he wants people to die because it spreads the word. <laughs> the more people die, the more people get interest because we're morbidly fascinated humans in that kind of thing. To shred, you say. <laughs> How long do you think it would take him to arrange all this, it, the ex, the shark infrastructure, shall we call it, uh, around the uh, around Jaws? How long do you think it will take for him to arrange all this? So the Cage will probably take the longest. Mm -hmm. The town's set up as a tourist town already. So there's loads of shell related tats. So all mm -hmm. he needs to do is just like get a marker pen and write, I survived the Amity Island Death Shark on it. <laughs> that would take long. <laughs> and the rest of the town are going to be on board. They're going to be helping as well. Yeah. Yeah. Getting a helicopter, that might come a little later down the line. Depends on how much money they've got. But yeah, I think you could do it within the season. So they do lose the sum of money. They'll lose some of it, but you've got to speculate to accumulate. Fourth of July weekend, that's what he's talking about there, isn't it? And then they say after August, that's it. Their season's over, essentially, isn't it? So they've got this two months to make all that money. Yeah. Yeah, but Ben's saying that this could be a year-round attraction. Yeah. They've got two concerns around that. Does the shark bother sticking around, waiting for the end of the season while they're constructing this and it hasn't got anything to eat? Or does it head off somewhere where there's people in the water? And then the other one is, one of the Jaws sequels is, you know, in the great tradition of Westworld and Jurassic Park, about setting up a, a sea life center around the shark. And it the one that scared me when I was a kid, the shark breaks the tunnel that people are yeah. doing it from. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't do that, so don't worry. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> similar idea. You know, these Jurassic Park-type films always end in disaster. Huge disaster. He wants it to end in disaster. He wants the morbid curiosity to spread the word of Amity. That's what he's leaning into. Yeah, but I'm talking about a disaster that ends the park. Not a disaster that's like one or two deaths here and there. Yeah, it's not going to be a park. It's Amity Island. There's helicopter spotting <laughs> excursions. <laughs> the shark is territorial. So once it's staked its claimed and pissed everywhere, it's not moving. Mm. I think that's how sharks do it. Okay. <laughs> piss. Shark piss. Anybody smell that? Shark piss. <laughs>
Oh, look out. <laughs> okay. Then I will bring this home. The good people of Amity have assembled at the town hall as Chief Brody prepares to announce the closure of the beaches. A chorus of concerned grumbles quickly gives way to cheers, laughter, and the clapping of hands as Mayor Vaughan makes Chief Brody disappear. Yes, Vaughan has swapped his anchors for moons and stars and taken an eight-hour intensive training course to become a member of the Magic Circle. Moments later, the chief emerges safely from the drop door that leads from the cellar to the street outside. <laughs> he returns to confront the mayor, but by then it's too late. Vaughan has assured the assembly the beaches will stay open and reluctantly advises Brody that he may enforce a 24-hour ban on swimming in the ocean beyond the buoys. As a way to show the spirit of amity, Vaughan then hands Brody a bouquet of flowers for his wife, which Vaughan produces from his sleeve. Brody is astonished, gasping and giggling with his hand over his mouth. Soon, the hunting teams are out in force, and they quickly return with the carcass of the tiger shark, to the delight of both Vaughan and Brody. Hooper, who has since arrived at the island, is less convinced, at least until Vaughan steps up with his lovely assistant, Mr. Posner, swishing his sword and cape around, geeing up the crowd. Oxygene by Jean-Michel Jarre plays over the tannoy as Vaughan takes flight. He passes through a hula hoop to prove there are no wires. <laughs> then he pushes his sword through the shark once, twice, thrice, before slicing it open and spilling the contents of its guts, including three majestic doves which fly out in a breathtaking formation and some human remains, proving the threat has been neutralized. The hand is quicker than the eye, so nobody saw him pull the guts from the pocket sewn into his jacket or kick the real stomach contents off the pier and into the sea. Some time prior, Vaughan had put Chrissy's remains in a magic box and sawn them clean, removing any evidence of shark attack. It's very likely there will be more shark attacks off the coast of Amity during the summer season, but with the power of misdirection, Vaughan will keep the beaches <laughs> open and the tourists flooding in. <laughs> 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 Magic mare. Some truly diabolical schemes there. Wait, wait. Questions. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you almost got away with it. So, Mayor Vaughan suddenly become David Copperfield. Yes. <laughs> Not suddenly. Eight hour intensive course. Okay. What age do you think David Copperfield started learning magic? I don't know, but the thing is, David Copperfield didn't have the power of the eight hour intensive training course. Ah, uh, okay. That was set up later, probably by David Copperfield. <laughs> Yeah, in the intro to the course, he says, I spent 18 years learning magic, but you can learn it in eight hours for only forty nine ninety five. Yeah, good. That was well answered. Does, yeah, does okay. nobody notice like blood dripping from his pockets as he's flying through the hula hoop? No, he's a, he, it's the power of misdirection, isn't it? If you saw the rabbit in the hat, it wouldn't be a good trick, would it? So the guts are sewn in really well. Okay. We don't know all the secrets because the magic circle is confidential, isn't it? He's got ziplocks in his pockets. <laughs> yeah, he's probably got yeah plastic baggies in there. <laughs> Just full of human remains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's he got the remains from? <laughs> they are the real remains from, he took some from Chrissy's body. Palm. Oh, <laughs> he just scooped them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Stuck him in his hat. <laughs> <laughs> he scooped him, bagged him up, had him in his pockets just for such an occasion. But nobody saw because of the hands quicker than the eye. <laughs> How long has he been going around with his guts in his, in his pockets? Oh, uh, you know, that afternoon. Just waiting for... The, uh, he's, I hope today's the day they catch a tiger shark, he thought to himself. <laughs> and luckily they did. How does he store him? In Ziploc bags, as we said. Zip block bags. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't hear that bit. Sorry. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. They're fresh, fresh as a daisy. I think that speaks to the power of a zip lock that they've managed to stay yeah. in such good condition. <laughs> Sealed in time, the fresh. So. Yeah. What brand would you say is the best brand of Ziploc bags? I think IKEA. They're great. They have great range. <laughs> <laughs> Ziploc is the brand, isn't it? it was, uh, yeah. But it's like Hoover, isn't it? Nobody's calling it a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> they're ubiquitous now, aren't they? Ziploc bags. <laughs> Tannoy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you could say it like this. We've had David Copperfield, John Hammond, and Donald Trump tonight. Mm. Yeah. Plus one more. Whatever mine is. 
<laughs> Any more questions for me? No, I think you've answered beautifully. Uh, all right. I'm just picturing in front of that shark flying through the hoop with quite a straight body. Yeah. That's what I hoped. <laughs> <laughs> Some truly diabolical schemes there, but who will get the votes? So first, we had Cinemaster's 666 point plan. Then we had Gaz's gaslight speech that trumped the shark. Then we had Ben's shark show, the viewing cage slash attraction. And finally, we had my magic circle bait and switch. But who... We'll get the votes, as I've already said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it again. Time to reveal the votes. Gaz, who have you voted for? I have taken the time to vote for Cinemaster. Oh, oh. Cinem- Cinemaster, who have you voted for? Well, I voted for the plan that was more likely to happen due to time constraints, which is Greg. Eight hour intensive course. Yeah, that was the most realistic, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Time constraints, down to the time constraints. <laughs> ben, who have you voted for? Well, I voted for the plan that initially I was least impressed with, but the performance in the questions that very nearly didn't happen wowed me. So I have also <laughs> voted for Wade. <laughs> I've drawn a little Ziploc bag full of human remains. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to split the vote right down the middle like a Ooh. split shark and I also voted for the Cinemaster yeah it's deserved it was oh, good bomb. so two votes for Craig and two votes for Cinemaster Gaz what's that done to the Diabolical Season 4 leaderboard well Craig you are still in the lead with 10 points Ooh. and in second place with 9 S- points is the Cinemaster Ooh. In third place with six points is myself. And bringing up the rear with three points is Ben. Ooh. The dreaded rear admiral. Looks like it's a two horse race. Well, it's early days. Yes, yeah, way early, way early yet. We've got loads of films yet. And speaking of which, next week, Gaz will be hosting. Gaz, what sexy ass film will we be watching? Funny you should say that. I've picked one of the sexiest films that I could find. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Debbie Does Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the villain in Debbie Does Dallas? <laughs> Debbie? Or Dallas? <laughs> We're going to be watching Brian De Palma's grotty classic, Body Double. Ooh. Oh, I do like Body Double. Wonderful. And that wraps up this episode like a strung up shark carcass. Thank you for listening. And if you have a healthy respect for sharks, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell and leave us a review on the very platform on which you're currently listening. You can follow us on social mediums at Diabolical Pod. If you're hungry for more Jaws and Jaws adjacent podcasts, go and stalk Sarah and MJ at Let's Jaws for a Minute as they take a deep dive through the franchise with a fine, sharp tooth comb before exploring further Spielberg and shark movies. Next week, we'll be competing to improve on the diabolical plot of Body Double. Until then, remember, amity means friendship. A one, a two, a one, two, three. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. Well, I had a little drink about an hour ago. too fast, Now it's gone way too fast. I had a little drink about an hour ago. About an hour ago. Right to my head. <laughs> Wherever I may roam, on land or sea or shore, you'll always hear me singing a song. Show me the way to go home. Boom, boom, cha. I've got two other plans that I've met, practically made as well. I'll, I'll um, okay. send them to you on the WhatsApp afterwards. They're pre- almost fully formed, the other two plans. I just ditched them.
Okay. Well, if we finish before half past, you can tell him. Nah, don't. <laughs> <laughs>